Welcome. I am Dr. Patrice Berry. I'm a licensed psychologist. Thank you for everyone that's going to be joining live. And then also, if you have any questions or comments, people on the replay crew, please let me know that as well. So this Take Care of Maya case, I saw it pop up and I knew it was a Netflix documentary. I did not watch the documentary at first, but then I saw some coverage of it and I was like, okay. So I went back, I watched the documentary. I have the video. So Natalie Lawyer Chick and I, we did a joint live and really she did a phenomenal job breaking down the history of this case and just all the different legal aspects of, and then I kind of broke down the psychological aspects of, of this case. And even with that video, it didn't go far enough because more things have come up in this trial. I have more questions. I have more concerns and you all have the same questions too. And so thank you, Sarah, for already commenting. Like, I guess it was posted and you commented. And then Lisa, welcome, welcome from Norway. Hello, hello. So let's hop right into some of y'all's phenomenal questions. And um, you all asked amazing questions, and I really appreciate that. That's where a lot of inf inspiration from this video came from. So we're, today we're going to cover what is board certification? Is ketamine addictive? Because I think Dr. Chopra pretty much said it wasn't. And then another medical doctor, or I think it was a medical doctor, said that it was. And so I could see the jury being very confused about that. And then we're also just going to, we're going to watch the judge instructions. The judge's instructions for this case, I think, are very powerful because the family has already settled with DSS. I also have a content warning for this video because, so I don't plan to dive deep into the allegations or anything, but there are allegations of things against a child. And so I want to be very mindful that, that this case can be very, very troubling. And it's totally understandable if you're like, nope not today. So after this stream at about 2 p.m. Eastern, I'll be going live talking about family secrets, covering Carrie Washington's family, and then also going deeper into Kirk Franklin's family. But yes, we'll also, and then while we're here, if y'all have questions along the way, I will definitely answer those. So I have lots of lawyer chicks here. And so there are lots of people from the lawyer you know, from Emily D. Baker. So it was really with the Amber Heard trial, that's when I started to kind of cover legal things that had a psychological component because Dr. Curry, like she's, she's phenomenal and I wanted to talk about it. And my family, I've mentioned it here before, my husband, he really doesn't follow this stuff. And so I don't have anyone else to talk about this stuff with. So I love getting to talk about these things with, with you all. So one of y'all asked, how is the hospital responsible for what happened to Beata? And that is what the family is alleging, especially since the state was the one that made the decisions and everything. And based on the information that's presented so far, I can kind of think about how the jury may or may not find the hospital liable. So we will see. The documentary is very triggering. So lots of people are covering, are watching the the coverage first, the trial coverage. I also hop into Law and Lumber. I hop into Rob's lives. He normally goes live about 8 p.m. Eastern. And um, because he dives deeper into like the legal aspects of this case. He's been doing like a nightly recap, but all right. And then somebody else asked. Oh, so then yeah. Somebody else asked about. Could there be consequences for the hospital and how did they bill? But they were saying she didn't have it. I have some thoughts on that. And so we will cover y'all's questions here today. First, let's start out with what is board certification? This comes up in a lot of expert testimony. So I am a licensed psychologist. I am not board certified. So board certification for a psychologist, it's not required. It's something that you can do. You have to be, so my, my training, I did four years of undergrad. I did five years of post, 
graduate. So my master's and my doctorate, that all took five years. I did a year residency after that. <laughs> and then I was able to be a licensed psychologist and pass my EPPP. I passed my licensing exam, my Virginia State exam. I did all those things. So some people, after all of that, they take additional they get additional supervision above and beyond that by a board certified psychologist. And that's where they end up being. And I think there's like a test. I think there's a verbal exam and a written exam. And you, you're you basically saying that you are competent to be able, and you were approved by a board of your peers. And they said, yes, you are competent. That's often very helpful for forensic experts because they get additional training in how to be a forensic a board certified forensic psychologist. For my practice, it really, I accept insurance. I don't do a ton of court stuff. Sometimes with custody issues or with um, kids with foster care, sometimes I have been pulled into court in the past. I try to avoid it if I can. Court can really negatively impact my relationship with the client. So what the court does, so my client has confidentiality, but if I have a court order that compels me to talk about what's happening in treatment, then I have to comply with the court order. Or if there, I can try to fight it nine times out of 10, I'm going to have to answer the questions as best I can. And so that's the whole thing. Now, there are some professions where you have to be board certified. So my child sees a board certified pediatrician. <laughs> I would not take my child to somebody who wasn't board certified. Like that's my own personal thing, because with pediatricians, there is an additional like they get additional training. I don't know. Like it's it's my own personal thing. So for medical doctors, they often do get board certification and sometimes it is required for their role. So in order to call yourself a, in, in a particular profession, it might be the standard that most people do get board certified. I hope that helps. Let me check out the chat just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Ah, Lee, welcome, welcome. Um, I hope you feel better. Um, the, the trial, so to me, the trial is going a lot deeper than the documentary did. And the documentary really focused a lot on DSS, I think, and some of Dr. Smith and then the other that the social worker, not the social worker that we're going to talk about today, because, excuse me, I'm going to play a little bit of testimony from from one of the social workers. But this case is just very, very difficult. I do want to hop in to talk about ketamine. So let me share my screen. This is for information only. OK. And this is the publicly available information. I am not a specialist in this. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not giving you any advice uh, on this topic. I am just sharing information. That's my little disclaimer. <laughs> and so um, this is from uh, American Addiction Centers. And first let's talk about what it is. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic that was approved back in the 1970s. And it's not approved to treat children for CRPS. Often uh, individuals get treatments that aren't certified. So like initially there are some medications that they find benefit something, but it might not be certified to treat that condition just yet because there needs to be additional research, additional things that happen. And so, um, I, I have heard of it being used to treat things like depression, chronic pain, and some other mental health, and then also physical conditions. I'm going to try to make this a little bigger. It's, there we go. And here we go. And so the effects of it. And this is what the hospital is going to try to, to claim that the initial symptoms and the reason why they wanted to get Maya off the ketamine is because one of the side effects of ketamine, which will, which is listed a little bit later, 
is stomach pain. But some of the effects can include sedation, dizziness, clumsiness, slurred speech, loss of consciousness, unresponsiveness to stimuli, dangerously slow breathing, all of these different things, which was why typically when she was receiving those higher doses of ketamine, it was in a doctor's office and she was under close monitoring. That's what I'm getting from the testimony that the family never did the infusions at home. And the infusion, I think it was a doctor that explained that the infusion gave a low dose gave a gave doses over a period of time versus what the the other options for administering the the medication um and so some side effects include mental side effects are diminished attention memory loss hallucinations and you see this in the um in the documentary because they recorded when maya did get the ketamine coma and they recorded her coming out of it and she did look very disoriented very and she did seem to be like seeing things and that was but that state was temporary and it ended up wearing off but and some of the delayed effects of ketamine use can include um, bladder pain and ulcers kidney issues chronic stomach pain depression and longer term memory deficits so that's that part now what I think the difficult thing with this is that, um, oh, let me go, let me share that one again, because I skipped the part, I think it's later on, where it talks about ketamine and whether it's addictive. Do, do, do. All right. So, okay, overdose and withdrawal. And so um, overdose is relatively rare that um, what needs to be monitored if it is being taken at higher doses are things like slow breathing, unconsciousness, those kinds of things. So abuse and addiction. So there is physical dependence. And I think when Dr. Chopra was talking about the fact that ketamine is an addictive, I think he was talking about the physical, that people don't go through the physical withdrawal like you see with um, alcohol or opioids or, or other, other types of substances like that. And that it is, but uh, legally, okay? And so I think this is, I know that the defense is likely going to bring an expert on that's going to talk about issues that can come up with, with ketamine. Now, what's not talked about, I think, enough is the fact that when you have chronic pain and you find something that works and then you're denied that thing, it's not that you're necessarily dependent on it. It's that that thing works for you. It's almost like, so there are some people that know that certain antibiotics don't work for them, or they know that that certain things. So um, I have a family member that was given a substance that their body negatively reacted to. And it wasn't a typical allergy, but for us, we will never allow that medication to be prescribed to our family member again. Like no matter what, like, like no medication in that class. We are not going to allow that to be prescribed to that family member because we know the effect that it, that it has on them. So patients have rights and I'm going to talk about that more, but people have the right to say what their preferences are with treatment. Now the, now the doctor is the one that ultimately gets to make the decision. And they, I think the family thought that they were going to be able to get the dose that they needed at the hospital. And for whatever reason, it was above the dose. So that's what it sounds like with John Hopkins, with All Children's Hospital. The amount that was being asked for was outside of what they were able to do. That's that's what it sounds like. But it doesn't sound like at first they even truly believed that she had the, the diagnosis. I, I honestly think they were off put by the family's the way that the family was advocating for their child, which if I was a parent in that situation, I would also, but because I'm a, I'm a psychologist, so I know that sometimes you have to talk to people gently in order for them to hear you. And I like, and we're going to, we're going to watch it a little bit later. One of the social workers talked about the fact that she's trained in de-escalating families, that first people have to know that they are seen and heard. And so um, I want to highlight the fact that 
um, there is a lot of um, uh, victim blaming and medical gaslighting that that can happen. And um, that is, and, and the recommendation was to not read the chat. Um, if you're watching over on Law and Crime. So Law and Crime's chat, like on, I don't really, so I like to watch the things there. I don't always engage with the chat that much. Sometimes I might say a thing or two, but um, sometimes I don't. And let's see what questions are coming in. Okay. Can you understand how Maya felt in the hospital? Oh, so I have seen this in person. So I used to work in acute residential, which is where children are having a mental health crisis. They come into the hospital for a period of time. And then once they're stabilized, we discharge them home. There were situations where because of the age of the child or because of what was happening in, in the family, there were times where that child just wanted to go home. And they, we just, we, we, as a treatment team, we said the symptoms we're seeing, is this just because this child is in the hospital and not able to, to see their family? Now, technically, so for, I want to clarify that they would be able to see their family, but not every family was able, didn't have the transportation or, or not every family had the means to come and visit. Our hospital tried our best to have free housing to offer ways for families if they needed support to come and visit. We, we tried to offer those things. Not every family was able to, to access those. But this is a great time to talk about the impact mental health can have on physical health and how physical health can impact your mental health. So it can be really hard to determine which came first. And it takes a treatment team that is client-centered, that is number one, listening to the client and family, which is ridiculous that I even have to say that. And that's where I thought Dr. Chopra's testimony, where Dr. Chopra was talking about how he trains clinicians in how to just listen and how to gather the information that you need in order to adequately and appropriately and responsibly treat your, your patient. The way that I view, so when somebody comes in for a first session with me, I like to talk about the fact that number one, coming in, to, in for therapy, coming in for a psychological evaluation, that is a difficult decision. Like, the barriers people have to jump over and the hoops people have to jump through just to get to my office. I know it's difficult and it's normal for somebody to not be able to open up about every last thing. And that honestly, I don't really want them to go too deep because the first session isn't really a treatment session. It's really an information gathering. I, I describe it as I just want to get to know your story. Um, and that it doesn't have to be in some linear way. <laughs> so I, I let people jump all over. My brain kind of works that way anyway. So I don't, I don't mind if people jump all over. And I know that sometimes, especially for very complex cases, that I am not going to get all the information that very first day, that maybe over the first few sessions, I am going to get enough to know, to be able, because for my job, I have to be able to do, find a billable diagnosis by the end of that session. If I'm not able to, to, to diagnose something, then when they come back, I have to finalize that so that I can back bill for that date with that diagnosis. But it really, this case just really is, it's hard to not be on Maya's side. Now, I know some people are, I don't know. So I am 100% team Maya. Like I, I just am. Um, I don't know that the family is going to get everything that they're asking for. I am very glad that they are highlighting the importance of patients, number one, knowing their rights. They were a family that knew their rights. So, okay, let's go ahead and hop into the part where the judge talks about the, let me, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Skip ad. Pause. Okay. So I have way too many streams open. <laughs> okay. I think this is the one I need right here. 
let's share this one. I'm almost positive this is the one that I need, where the judge is going to talk about the period of time that the jury can consider for Maya's confinement. And I'm almost positive that is what, oh no, this is, this is the physical therapy. Yes, this is that part. Let's go. You were last with us that you have not been approached by anyone about this case. Is that correct? And um, I want to confirm since you were last with us that you have not seen any sort of media coverage about this case. Is that correct? Okay. Um, members of the jury, I'm going to give you a uh, instruction. I'll be doing this from time to time. During opening instructions, I told you that Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital reported suspected child abuse to the Department of Children and Families in good faith and that the hospital cannot be found liable in this case for having made that report. After that report, so I just want to clarify. So that was a decision that the that the judge had already come to. So people are mandated reporters. I am a mandated reporter. And if I suspect, it's not even if I, if, if, if alleged, if I know that something has happened, it's if I suspect something has happened and I have a reasonable suspicion, then I have to call. And sometimes I've called and I've said, hey, is this reportable? And I've been told no. Okay not reportable. I document that I called and that's, and that's that. Um, if something is reportable, then I, I report it and then DSS investigates. I don't do the investigation. Um, there have been situations where I had enough rapport with the family where I was able to tell them like, Hey, based on this information, just a heads up, I am going to have to make this call. And that just kind of helped. Um, Sometimes DSS didn't want that to happen because they didn't want the family to try to talk the child or to try to coach their response or anything. And so that's that's a whole thing. So the hospital can't be find, found liable for making the call. So for that initial involvement, that was their role. They had to do that part. The report was made. The Department of Children and Families filed an action against Jack and Beata Kowalski. In that action, the department obtained a court order from the dependency court authorizing the department to take custody of Maya Kowalski on October 13th, 2016 at 2.30 a.m. in the morning. The department's custody of Maya Kowalski was supervised by the dependency court in that case. The dependency court made the decision to keep Maya Kowalski at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital after October 13th, 2016. Only the dependency court was authorized to transfer or release Maya Kowalski from the hospital or to return custody of Maya Kowalski to her parents. You have heard witnesses suggest that Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, quote, took, end quote, Maya Kowalski from her parents. Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital did not take custody of Maya Kowalski away from her parents on October 13, 2016. And Mr. Kowalski is not making a claim in this lawsuit that the hospital did. However, Jack Kowal sorry, Mr. Kowalski claims that Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital falsely imprisoned Maya Kowalski on three specific occasions. First, he claims that the hospital falsely imprisoned her for a period of time between October 7th, 2016, the first day that Maya Kowalski arrived at the hospital, until October 13th, 2016, when the dependency court's order gave custody to the department. Second, Mr. Kowalski claims that Maya Kowalski was falsely imprisoned between October 18th, 2016 and October 20th, 2016, when the hospital placed her in a room by herself and videotaped her for approximately 48 hours. So. Third, uh, Mr. Kowalski claims that Maya Kowalski was falsely imprisoned on January 6th, 2017, when hospital employees placed Maya Kowalski in a room, removed some of her clothing, and took photographs of her body. Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital denies that it falsely imprisoned Maya Kowalski 
on those three occasions. These three false imprisonment claims are not claims about Maya Kowalski's custody and are not impacted by the dependency court's custody order. The plaintiff's claims for medical malpractice or battery are not affected by the dependency court's order. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, typically, and the family did this, the family, once they realized they weren't going to get the treatment that they were looking for, that they needed, that their medical team had recommended, they immediately said, we want to take her home. And the hospital said no. And from my understanding of how, now if she was openly bleeding, if she was, to me, from where I am, okay, just having looked at this case, there wasn't a medical reason because she she was stable enough to to go home. She wasn't in an immediate, now she was she was in a ton of pain. And they were trying to do things and procedures that were that were likely going to increase her pain. I've heard a lot of talk about the the blood pressure cuff, and um, I like how Dr. Chopra and how others have talked about with CRPS the lightest of touch, so that Maya typically wore shorts because just the lightest of touch would cause her significant pain, and um, and so you can be discharged against medical advice. So that happened. So if, unless there was a court order. So in, in my state, Virginia, and I've worked in psychiatric hospitals, that at any point, somebody that willingly signed themselves into the hospital, at any point, they could say, I want to go home. As long as they weren't an imminent risk to themselves or others. And if they were an imminent risk, we had to file a court order, and then it was up to a judge to decide. So they would be scheduled. So it's called a temporary detainment order. And in our state, if a police officer does it, it's called an emergency custody order. There has to be an order. Somebody has to take the person into their custody and that individuals can be discharged against medical advice. And there were some times when, when a parent was just like, I don't like the treatment, like, but the, there wasn't a reason for us to say it was against medical advice. The person was stable enough by the time they were wanting to go home. Because if we were saying they were discharged against medical advice, and if it was a child, we would sometimes have to call social services because if that child needs some type of treatment that their parent is refusing to get, and they're refusing any type of mental health treatment, and this child is a potential risk, then sometimes we, we would have to make that call. Because it could be considered medical neglect, not getting someone the treatment that they needed. And it wasn't that the family was saying they didn't want her to get treatment at all. They were just saying that they weren't happy with the care that they were getting at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And from where I stand, they should have, and from my opinion, they should have been able. So the hospital tried to make a report. The first report, it's my understanding, the first report to CPS or DFS, I forget what it's called down there, that it was, they didn't take the case. And then Dr. Smith got involved. And because of the Netflix documentary, ugh. okay, so Dr. Smith and the other social worker got involved and that's when, yes. And then, and the family isn't even claiming because my whole thing with this case is the reason why Maya stayed in the hospital was because the hospital continued to believe or tell the court, it's my understanding, that they were still telling the court that they believed that the family was making her sicker or that the family was a risk or danger to her when there doesn't seem to be, from my opinion, there wasn't evidence that that's true. I want to jump back to a question and I will catch up on comments and questions. Um, so this is a great question. Would I still be the person's treating therapist after being compelled into court or would they have to switch so this is a really great question and nine times out of 10. So the way that I, the way that I handle being brought into court, what's most common is that I'm brought into court under, it's a custody issue. And that one parent wants me to testify about what the child is saying about another parent. So what I do is I give that other parent a heads up. Hey, this is what I can say. And this is what I can't say. 
And typically nine times out of 10 in those situations, I don't have an opinion about which parent should have the child. I, I typically don't, unless I'm working with that child, unless I have clear evidence of why this parent shouldn't have interactions with the child. And I would have documented that very meticulously. I would have done a treatment agreement with, with the parent. I would have documented things in a way where I'm covering myself because it can be a complaint to my board if I testify about something that I don't have the ability. So, and that's actually happened in my state, uh, that a person who was treating one, a, a child, they made a recommendation about custody for a parent that they had never met. And in my state, experts can't do that. You, you can't give an opinion about a parent that you've never worked with, that you have to actually, you have to have met the person. You have to, because that, that, that therapist was going off of information that the child and the other parent was giving, which may or may not have been, have been completely accurate, that you have to work with that other person. I hope that helps. Uh, so uh, nine times out of 10, I typically do continue to work with the individual. Uh, for my foster care cases, I gave my clients a heads up. I often talked with them like, hey, I'm going to court to talk about your case. Is there anything that you want the judge to know? So I'm, I'm big on client-centered treatment. And so even if I'm working with a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, I want them to be in not control. I want them to have a say in their in their treatment. Some people have, yes, they definitely have things they want me to tell the judge. Sometimes people don't know what they want, but which is fine. Um, let's go through here. All right. All right. Oh. If a child is in the hospital for mental health and the family wants them to be checked out against hospital wishes, which is, okay, let me just put this one up here. Um, so let's say in, in my state, so, because if the, if the person is going to normally if the child is still an active risk, in my experience, as long as that family has a good relationship with the treatment team, they what I've seen happen more often than not is insurance deny the stay. <laughs> so uh, Monday mornings was always a big discharge day because if my clients, if nothing had happened over the weekend, normally the, the insurance company looked at for children, they looked at two to three days of stability, no major issues, that the person was okay to go home. And so sometimes we would wait until like Monday because the, the treatment center I was at, the kids did go to school. And so we would sometimes wait to see, did anything happen? Like, did they have a smooth transition to school? Um, I would meet with them to see, you know, how are things going? How are they feeling? I would talk with the family, you know, we're submitting, we're going to meet as a treatment team to find out what's happening. And then we would kind of go from there. And if we did need to appeal a decision, because let's say insurance denied, and we had additional information to appeal, we would, or sometimes people would, would, would be sent home. So what I saw more often than not was people want to stay, but insurance not, um, that they thought they were good enough to go home. In my state, we have home-based therapy that's meant to minimize out-of-home placements. Now, this is only available for individuals with Medicaid, and there's also some home-based crisis stabilization that sometimes is available for people with or without Medicaid. And so we would often try to help partner the family with other resources. I only had to call on a family one time, and... Um, I met with my supervisor. We we talked about the issues and it never resulted in anything because once DSS reached out, the family complied with whatever the reasonable recommendation was, <sighs> especially for children, two to three days. Was like, so acute hospitalization is so hard. So, so, so hard. 
Um, and I try to minimize um, on TikTok. They call them grippy sock. Um, so I try to, if people can be stabilized at home, I've had some people go into acute stays and get worse um, because it, it's not about therapy. Acute stays in Virginia, acute hospitalization in Virginia is really about medical stabilization that we only did, we only had to do Monday through Friday, 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes of therapy a day. Now, the person also received occupational therapy and art therapy and music therapy. They were on a therapeutic wing and received interventions on social skills groups and all those other things. But me as the therapist, I, tip, I only had to meet with, um, and I could have up to five clients. Um, I only had to meet with them for about 20 to 30 minutes. Some individuals I would spend a little bit longer with if we were trying to talk about, okay, their safety plan and all that different stuff. But that's that part. All right. And so then I also wanted to talk about treatment. So if the hospital did think that Maya had Munchausen by proxy or fictitious or disorder by proxy. Conversion disorder is where an individual is having, um, so their physical symptoms, people, there's no medical confirmation for the, for the symptoms. And it's what we call psychogenic or psychosomatic pain. And, but you have to rule out a, a medical thing. And from where I stand, especially since now somebody said that CRPS can be diagnosed by a nerve doctor. In this case, I keep hearing the neurologist coming up a lot that a neuropsychologist did testing and somehow lost all his data. And, and so, yes. So the medical and mental health profession, to me, it works best when people acknowledge their, their bias. That there are some people that struggle with families that are very vocal or that question their authority, or there are some providers that struggle with that. I I think people should advocate for, for themselves. And I've had to tell clients because sometimes I've had a client that's my therapy client and they were like, oh, I was watching TikTok. I think I might have this. <laughs> and, and so I believe, so some, sometimes self-diagnosis can be valid if you're getting it from like legit sources, sources that are providing good, accurate information. Sometimes over on TikTok, I've seen like five signs you have ADHD, but all those signs are also consistent for anxiety and like it's it's for a bunch of different things. It wasn't only ADHD. And so um, I do believe that people can kind of, because not everybody can afford a $1,500 to $3,000 psychological evaluation to get a, a diagnosis that some people I know. And so... Um, uh, and there was a doctor that got in trouble on, on TikTok. So I do a lot more here on YouTube now. So TikTok was where I really, that's, that's the platform that grew the most for me at first. I have way more fun over here. And so I invest more on, on YouTube now. Um, but every now and then I will, I will post things over, over on TikTok, but I tried to make sure that anything I posted, that it was accurate <laughs> and that it wasn't too general. Cause some people post just very general, vague things that really anybody could kind of identify with it. So that's my own personal thing. Um, Somebody asked a question, why is it that hospitals only deal with the physical and not the mental health? So this particular hospital, so sometimes when hospitals can't find a physical condition or if they think there might be something psychological going on, they will call for a mental health consult. And that's where sometimes the individual will meet with a psychiatrist excuse me and a psychiatrist is a medical doctor that prescribes medication. They will sometimes meet with a psychologist or they will sometimes have a social worker that's a licensed therapist that that they meet with um, just to kind of rule out anything. To me, the individuals, it doesn't seem like a real thorough history. I, I wonder if the information, the fact that John Hopkins put the infusion tube that 
they used for the ketamine, um, it's my understanding, for, for the ketamine coma, that John Hopkins was actually the one that, that did that, that they had CRPS in her medical record from 2015. I wonder if any of that stuff is going to come up. I know they keep bringing up, I think, Tampa. There's something about Tampa General where they were saying that conversion disorder was mentioned. And that's why I brought that one up. That fictitious disorder is an individual who wants attention for med for medical things. Conversion disorder is an individual that experiences psychological pain in a somatic way, but it's like it's it meets criteria for that for that particular disorder. So everyone, when I get anxious, sometimes my because we have emotions show up in our body. <laughs> emotions show up in our body. And there's this great, I know I have it over on the community tab. It's how to feel your feelings. And our feelings, they show up as my, my palm feeling sweaty, my heart, you know, my chest getting tight. Maybe I get a little headache. That sometimes those are the physiological sensations that go along with anxiety. But with pain, so pain can increase mental health conditions and mental health conditions can increase pain. And it has this dynamic. I haven't heard, so correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't seen her outpatient therapist. I don't know that her outpatient therapist has testified yet. Please let me know if they have, because if they've tested, I definitely want to hear if they call that person because Maya was in outpatient therapy, which is very common for people with, with chronic pain, especially the fact that she couldn't be in school and that she did have limitations with where her CRPS was during, during that time and just kind of the fluctuation with her mobility and all of those things. So that those things can have an impact on that somebody might just feel a little sad. Like there, there can be things that come up because of that, um, but it's triggered by the mental health condition. And then, like I said, if you get overly stressed, then sometimes that can increase pain and then it can just kind of go back and forth. And so I, I do think this is my opinion, that being in the hospital and not having contact with her family, Maya was never going to get better in, in that state because the stress of that situation was going to exacerbate her, her pain. It was going to make her want to say or do anything to have contact with her family again. And then to me, it was highly inappropriate for the hospital staff to try to be convincing her, especially like the, the non-mental health staff. <laughs> so like just the, it's my understanding, the nurses, doctors, people trying to convince her that her, that there was something wrong, wrong with her mom. And, and there, I don't believe there was. That mom did a psychological evaluation and got clearance. And that those are the questions I have, like why wasn't that considered? And I wonder if it was just, the judge, the hospital, if they thought that somehow mom had tricked the the evaluator, which I don't think is true. I, I don't think Beata had any mental health conditions before the removal of, of her daughter, which triggered that um, depression. So the one psychologist, I'm bad with names, I think it was Dr. Duncan, I could be wrong, but that psychologist that evaluated Mom first, I believe evaluated dad, and then also evaluated Maya, which I've said before, I personally wouldn't have evaluated all three because it can make you look biased. Me, me personally, if I evaluate parents, I don't evaluate the child. If I evaluate the child, I won't evaluate the parents if, there, if there's legal involvement. If there's not legal involvement, then this is just family, you know, everybody, you know, if, if it's just a situation like that, then I have evaluated parents and children. But if there's court involvement, I don't. I think it looks more objective if there's a different evaluator that evaluates both. All right. Valerie IV. When a medical condition may be triggered by a psychological component, do doctors think that... So the pain is real. So even... Psycho, so pain you feel, so pain, the pain sensors, so pain sensors are in our brain. So there are some people that are physically unable to feel pain. And what I mean by that is there are people that the pain center of their brain is for less, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say broken. And they could put their hand on a burning stove and they don't feel pain. The inability to feel pain is a like that is a, a person can 
DIE, like, like a person can, that that's like, because pain lets us know that there's an issue. Pain is like, oh, it lets me know that there's something that needs my attention. So <laughs> I just got a bike. <laughs> I haven't ridden a bike in forever. And it would be really, really bad if I decided to ride that brand new bike for like five miles the very first time, I would be in excruciating pain, maybe unable to walk <laughs> the, the next day. Like, I don't, I don't need to, to go and do that. But that would be my body telling me, ooh, Dr. Barry, you need to go sit down somewhere. You did too much. <laughs> that sometimes pain can be can be a thing. And so, ah, Sarah, I didn't know that. Wow. Welcome, Sarah. Um, I did not know that. And that, Sarah, that helps me know why this case is touching you in, in such a way. Because, um, and then I know Matt Bond is another viewer um, subscriber that also has chronic pain as well. Welcome, welcome. Hello, hello. Uh, so I hope that was clear that pain that is somatic is still real. Like, like you still really feel the pain, but it's treated differently. So if somebody's anxiety is triggering the pain, helping them better manage the anxiety might lower that pain. And then I work with individuals with chronic pain that we have, that we have to work on um, how they manage uh, their emotions and all of that. Somebody asked a really great question, and I did a short video on it, on treatments that work for, um, for chronic pain, because I'm not a fan of cognitive behavior therapy. So cognitive behavior therapy says you have a thought, an action, and a behavior, and that, or feelings and behavior, and there's this triad of thought, you know, feeling, behavior, and that there's this loop. And that by addressing irrational thoughts, that that can improve how you feel. And to me, the way I hear that is that you tell somebody that has chronic pain that like, it's not a, I don't know, like, it's just, so the, the things that you would have to tell them, my brain can't even say. So what I tell people is the pain is real and we have to learn to live with pain. So if I have clients that, the lowest pain they possibly ever feel is a five out of 10, then we recalibrate their scale that a five out of 10 is actually a good day for them so that they can enjoy that day. Because if their pain normally stays at an eight out of 10 or a seven, if it normally stays higher than that. And so we tr typically try to scale it. And, um, and sometimes we have to make adjustments. And that acceptance and commitment therapy talks about how to live well with pain that that's something that comes up with that. Oh, Linda, I know they truly thought that she was faking it and I don't, and she was not. And even like the physical, like, so I have worked with individuals that were either accused or found guilty of Munchausen by, by proxy. And what happens in a true Munchausen case, what happens is you remove the child and the child gets significantly better significantly, not just a little bit. So pain goes up and down. And so there were some days Maya probably had a good day. I think she might have had a better day, but her physical condition got worse and worse and worse inside the hospital. And also, so my thoughts go out to Kyle because, uh, Kyle, um, I truly, so trigger warning for dark, dark thoughts. Um, I don't think Beata saw that she was ever going to be allowed to see her daughter again. And, and this wasn't an, an imagined thing. She wasn't being paranoid. Like there was truly a, a perception of her that was keeping her from her child, including even being able to hug her child. So in yesterday's testimony, uh, they read, I believe it was the detective read Beata's note. And that is just heartbreaking. In it, she wrote a letter to the judge, or was an email. She wrote an email to the to the judge. I don't believe it was ever sent. I believe they found all of that um, as part of their investigation, just to kind of rule the manner of the death. They were trying to figure out what what had happened, and my heart just truly breaks for this family because that type of loss. I don't think I've done a video on it, and I can. Uh, we are coming out of uh, Suicide Prevention Month, 
that was in September. And that type of loss, it's not a, it's not, it's not normal grief. It is, it is traumatic. It impacts people. No, grief impacts people forever anyway. But this type of loss truly, truly just, it can make other people in the family, it can make them struggle to find hope. And I truly think the family, they're coming together to, to do this case and that they want to get her story out there and that they want to take care of Maya because they really felt that, you know, that, that that's how Beata's memory lives on that you have to find purpose in pain if you do not. So pain with no purpose is suffering. Pain with no purpose is suffering. And that often people find, so that's why a lot of medical doctors, so I, I have a friend who's who's a medical doctor and his uh, he suffered severe burns as a child and did not feel that he was treated well by the emergency um, professionals and by the hospital. And through that pain, he decided, I want to become a medical doctor. And now he's an ER doctor and is phenomenal and is doing great things. And um, me personally, so I had a bad experience with a middle school guidance counselor. And that's where my passion and drive to help children and listen to kids and to not talk to kids like they don't know what's going on with them. So that's the way. So some people, they think like, oh, kids, they don't know. I have had some of the most thought provoking conversations with eight, nine and 10 year olds that you would think like, oh, like they're too young. They can't know. Like these were deep conversations. I've had situations come up where sometimes I've used projectives. So that was the type of test, that sentence completion, that that um, doctor, I want to say it's Dr. Duncan, I could be wrong, but the psychologist that evaluated Maya, she gave her sentence completion and it was, I want, and Maya said to go home and everything, my wishes, like everything was just centered around wanting to go home and to see her family. And so let me come back to the chat. I agree. It's unclear what exactly. So I truly think, um, so I try to be neutral. I am team Maya. I do think the hospital thought that they were right. I'll, I'll say it that way. Despite not trying to confirm the CRPS diagnosis, but uh, we're not going to go there. I think the hospital truly believed that they were doing the, the right thing. But I don't think they went about it in a way that anybody would ever want to, to talk to them. So you have to, so with, you have to have bedside manner. Like you have to, you can't keep people away from their families. Like it's just, it's a whole thing. Um, just checking out the comments. Yes, pain and depression are under, yeah, are linked. Yes. Yes. And um, so the way that I look at acceptance is that acceptance is an approval. It's just not fighting reality. So that if I have a chronic issue and if I'm still trying to live my life as though I don't have, like completely, that I might have to make some adjustments. So I've had to talk with some of my chronic pain clients. They've needed to get a um, handicap sticker. Like they've needed to make certain adjustments. If they were going on a trip, they would have to make sure that they, you know, just in case they did have a medical emergency while they were there, like they they had to, do, to take extra considerations and everything. So, um, yeah, so Gypsy, yo, and Gypsy Rose was just released. Are you saying Gypsy Rose's mom had... So I saw that Gypsy Rose was was recently, or she's about to be released, or she was recently released. Yes. And so I truly think um, Beata lost all hope. I tru I think Beata would still be here if that judge, and that's where I think the hospital might play that the judge and DSS had a bigger role than they did, despite the fact that they were the ones giving the court the information, saying that mom was, I don't know. Um, after after they denied Beata that hug, I think she just because it was it was within days or within a week or so after that that court date, she just lost all all hope. Hey Phoenix, welcome welcome. Um, let me see. 
<gasps> so I children are supposed to try to um so I've worked with children. So the way that I look at manipulation is it's trying to get your needs met in inappropriate ways. So, um, but if you are living with somebody who is a narcissist, you have, you, you can't get your needs met in normal ways. Like that is emotionally, like it's a, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. I've done videos on, um, adults of, um, of emotionally immature parents. <clears throat> Uh, so I do not, I believe children should try to get their way. I told y'all the story about my five-year-old hiding the, the phone. It was a whole thing. Okay. So while I check the chat, I'm going to go on ahead and play a little bit. Who is this next person? Uh, I want to play a little bit of Dr. Chopra. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. He does a great job explaining pain. And there we go. Share. Make this bigger. All the little links to these are down in the description. Let's go. Example. Yeah. Am I yeah, no, please. I'm I'm asking you to, to go through if it's okay. Great. For um, example, obviously the first one is that the patient has severe excruciating pain and there is no other explanation to it. Nothing else explains it. Um, that's the number one. Number two, um, the rest are kind of optional and you have to pick and choose which ones you can you see. So one of them is, um, is it a temperature difference? So if, if I have CRPS in the left leg and so the temperature in my left leg might be hotter or colder as compared to the right leg. Um, the next thing is you look at color change. Oftentimes the affected side is either dark red in color, even blue in color as compared to the right side. Um, you look for swelling. Uh, in the initial phases, swelling is pretty obvious. Uh, later on, you don't see it as much. So you look for swelling in these patients. You look for skin changes. The and I think what Dr. what Dr. Chopra's testimony is getting at is that CRPS can be identified, and that there is a cert, there are certain things that you look for, and that I believe he's saying that Maya had these things, and that somebody that was more familiar that they would have been able to pick up on those things. Skin may sometimes become thin and shiny, or they may develop small tiny lesions, uh, almost like blisters uh, that are painful. They, de they can de develop that. Uh, they even develop hair changes. Some patients actually grow more hair and some patients have less hair. And it can be in the same side or on the opposite side. You can see nail changes. Their nails start to kind of break off. They get brittle nails. Um, and um, what about uh, asymmet asymmetry in muscle groups from right to left? Is that right. an indication? I was getting to that. So, <laughs> Sorry. The, so the last one is um, muscle symptoms. So do they have what's called dystonia? Dystonia is a, is a very, is a, is a terrible condition. So I'm going to show you, like, uh, if I had dystonia in my left hand, it would be like a tight muscle, like, arm is taking a life of its own and it's cramping up or they may have tremor. So they may not have tremor when you don't do anything, but if you say touch them and then they start to have a tremor, uh, they may have muscle weakness, they have muscle atrophy, the muscle starts to shrink. So they, there are many muscle symptoms that these patients can have. I want to, uh, if you could, uh, and, and I think uh, I wanted you to explain uh, what really happens in CRPS, the, the central. I want you to explain what we know so far about CRPS, I mean, how it second. starts. Yes. I just have one other clarification on Go CRPS. Ahead, when I say that these patients have pain, we're talking about the world's worst pain. I mean, <clears throat> 
This pain is worse than amputation pain. This pain is worse than childbirth pain. The gentlemen on the jury won't understand that, I'm sure. Uh, this pain is so bad, so bad. <clears throat> the worst part about this pain is that, you know, if I stub my toe, it looks like the world is going to come to an end, okay? But I know that this is going to go away in a few minutes. But CRPS pain does not go away. It's there 24 hours, seven days of the week, and they, it just stays on and on and on. And the worst part is that there's no known treatment to this. We try all sorts of things. Some work, some don't work. But this is such a this is this is often known as a suicide condition because these patients, the pain is so bad. They can't sleep, they can't eat, they can't work. Um, their families don't believe. And I think that's where uh, Sarah was talking about pain and, and depression. So pain, when you get no relief from it, that can really cause additional additional issues. I've heard similar so that people with fibromyalgia or people with lupus, that it really takes. Sometimes people get sent to psychologist or get sent to see if there is a mental health condition. But when you have pain, that pain has to be manageable. And, and that um, there are, there are ways that conversion disorder or somatic things present that's very different from a medical condition. And um, it's wow. It's just wow. We're going to, we're going to continue. Them Because, you know, you don't think like, Somebody, the general impression is, oh, you have pain, take a Tylenol and it'll get better. This is not Tylenol pain. This is your hand in a hot stove. That's exactly what they described as. Uh, in fact, patients describe it as that, as if their hand is inside a hot fire stove and, <clears throat> and, and they can't take it out. That's the thing. So I just want to clarify that this is, when I say pain, it's not a small itty bitty uh, pain in the joints. And what is the McGill pain scale? The McGill pain. So McGill and then I also just wanted to say, because sometimes it's come up that Maya looked as though she was okay or that she looked as though. And I liked when her physical therapist talked about knowing Maya so well that she could tell just from a grimace, from just like a way that she might look that, okay, that that's too far. It's, it's too much. Because often people that experience chronic pain, often desperately, they don't want to be. And they often mask. And so masking is where... People really can't tell what all is really going on because they're in excruciating pain all the time and that often they will try to just kind of turn it off. And there are ways that our brains try to protect us from that as well, where sometimes I worked with some people with chronic pain that describe uh, dissociation or checking out. I'm not saying that that's what was happening in this case, just speaking in general, that um, some individuals that I work with have, have talked about um, losing small periods of time just because the pain got so bad and they realized, oh, wow, it's been 30 minutes and, and they hadn't they hadn't even noticed. Yale University in Canada uh, decided to see like, OK, where do pain conditions stand? So they interviewed a bunch of people and they, they said, all right, where where in this scale would you put your pain, uh, like pain from labor or pain from amputation of a digit? And so they they drew a scale, and that scale, CRPS was from the, <coughs> CRP was, was way above anybody else. It was way above <laughs> amputation pain, cancer pain, or even labor pain. With your permission, Your Honor, I'd like to publish a uh, photo of the McGill pain scale. All right. So Dr. Chopra was absolutely amazing. Really enjoyed his testimony. He gets into some jokes that I, because at, at first, uh, so he can come off a little, I don't know, but he has a really, I think he has like a dark sense of humor. And by the end, he was just like, please, just, just let me go home. Please release me from, from the subpoena. 
uh, Dr. Dr. Chopra, I thought he did a good job. I did also want to mention that there was a social worker that testified, I believe it was this, mm, my brain, was it, might have been yesterday. Could have been, mm, no, could have been, I don't know. But there was a social worker that, that testified and I thought, she no longer works for the hospital. She was the social worker that was on call. So this all happened the night of a hurricane. And the family, and so the social worker that was typically there wasn't on, wasn't there that day. So sometimes when there's a storm coming, often hospitals, they'll say, they'll ask their staff, who can just hunk, like who can just stay overnight, like just in case trees are down or like people have issues, like who can just stay? And she ended up covering, because she normally was in the pediatric oncology unit and she ended up being there. And she provided information that the family did not seem to be like overly combative. They didn't seem to be unreasonable, but they, she did admit that they, they did seem escalated and that they were upset and that they weren't okay with the way things were going on. And the idea of culture came in. So that was something that I had talked about during my conversation with um, cause I, I lived in Germany. I, I know a little bit about Eastern European culture and that sometimes there can be a, a style of communication. Um, and so there was a part of me that was wondering was, was culture playing, playing a role. And, um, and I think, I think Beata was just on her stuff. <laughs> uh, she, she sounds like she was a phenomenal nurse and she stayed on track of her child's treatment. And I mentioned on Natalie's stream that one night, I normally if, if I have a family member that stays overnight in the hospital, and if my family member is being medically stabilized, I normally try to stay with them if, if I can. Uh, so that happened. I was staying overnight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a different story than I did with Natalie. I was staying overnight with a family member that had had surgery and the surgery required that they have a brace on. Well, I was watching the nursing staff and I saw a different nurse come in and take his brace off. I was like, okay. Well, then the night nurse came in and the night nurse was like, was trying to get my family member to sit up, but they weren't supposed to sit up without their brace on. And so I mentioned, oh, the brace isn't on. And the nurse looks at me and was like, the notes say, say it is. <laughs> so I just said, it's over there in the chair. <laughs> like, like, the brace wasn't on. It was over there in the chair. And if, and if that nurse had tried to pick up my family member without that brace, it could have done harm to their, to their, to their body. And so like when you have people in the, like you have to watch, you have to watch the staff. People make mistakes. Doctors are people, nurses are people, and I adore. So people that are doing their job well. So I I adore treatment teams. Like I I like people that are doing their job well. I really appreciate that. And then there's sometimes. So what happened was the nurse that did the chart didn't get the information that the other nurse had taken the brace off. They just they just never got it. And so uh, I I understood why like there was so much passion there was so much going on in that in that moment um it can also be medical trauma for the family watching their family member struggle especially when they don't feel like they're being listened to uh that in and of itself can cause a lot for for a family and so really quick let me know if y'all have any questions before because i have the other stream coming up in about 20 minutes where we're going to talk about family secrets and when should you tell a child if they're adopted or if they're conceived by, you know, sperm donor or like, well, what information should we give children if who they think is their biological parent isn't? At what age should, should we do that? Spoiler alert, I think it's as very, very young. Like, I don't think uh, I've worked with people that have found out the, that information from other people or on their own, and it's it, it can be really, really difficult to hear and try to conceptualize later. And then I've worked with people that have known all their life, and sometimes the information is still hard, 
but knowing later doesn't make it any less hard. And so, especially talking about it from Carrie Washington's story, but yeah, we're going to do that. Um, all right. And so I appreciate you all. I hope that y'all enjoy the rest of your day and yeah, so we're all done. I hope y'all have a good one. Bye.